So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, our academic rounds at the Brunswick Heart Center. And it's my pleasure today to, uh, we've invited a guest speaker from Halifax, uh, congenital heart surgeon, Dr. David Horn, uh, who's gonna tell us on uh, anomalous pulmonary veins and the warden will get you out of jail. And it's really a, a follow-up a conversation that I had with him recently on uh, anomalous pulmonary vein patients that we see periodically. Uh, in terms of how to best address them from a surgical point of view. Uh, with all, uh, with that, uh, I'll pass it on to you, David. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and you can see my screen with the title yeah. there. Yes, it's perfect. Perfect. So anomalous veins um, occurs in about one in 1,500 uh, live births. Um, so it does cross our paths every now and then, even as adult surgeons. Um, and I'm going to start with two cases. And the first case... Um, is one that I get called for every now and then from, from here in uh, uh, the QE2. Uh, so this is a 73-year-old male that's going in for cabbage with Zlatko. Um, the TTE shows he's got a dilated RA and RV. Normal LV function and antralateral hypokinesia, small PFO. He had a pre-op CTA for uh, chest, uh, which said there's no calcification. Um, but there, um, as the stenotomy is performed, the radiologist calls in and says, you know what? The radiology resident missed the anomalous left upper pulmonary vein draining into the nominate vein. So how much swearing is going on in Zlatko's OR right now? So I'll move to another case before, sorry, here's the imaging. So here you can a see lot. see the vertical vein here. Uh, Zlatko says a lot, yeah. So from the upper, upper left upper lobe draining into this vertical vein, which is the equivalent of Marshall's ligament. Um, or a left SVC, but it just has a different name in this anatomy, going into the, nom into the nominate and down into the SVC. Um, so before I go into how, how to address that case, i uh, give you another case here of a 38-year-old year, female um, that has a, or goes for a regular checkup. ECG shows some right axis deviation, a little bit of RVH. X-ray shows mild cardiomegaly. It's sent to cardiology and Echo shows a little bit of right atrial and right ventricular enlargement, RVSP is still normal. No shunts are seen. Um, and as any good cardiologist would do, say, well, something must be wrong. I'm missing something. Does an MRI. Confirms the right-sided enlargement. Um, and it confirms there's an anomalous right upper pulmonary vein draining into the SVC. Uh, but no ASD. And the QPQS ratio, fortunately, they did that. It's 1.35 to 1. These, these two presentations are for these less benign or uh, less severe cases of anomalous veins, quite the common presentations is going for a physical checkup or incidental findings, usually not symptomatic. Um, so this is her MRI. So you can see the, the SVC draining into the right atrium and you can see this big vein coming in from the upper and middle lobe, um, uh, which people sometimes think is an azygous, but an azygous, remember, is above the pulmonary artery, where, more in line with where the arrowhead is. Um, uh, giving you the, the clue. And so this one is not right at the right atrial SVC junction. And that's the variation that can occur. The, this uh, uh, for the right upper anomalous pulmonary vein can occur anywhere from the junction, anyway, all the way up to the anomalous vein itself. So now what? So 2020, the American Heart Association uh, published adult congenital guidelines on um, basically all adult congenital heart disease that would come that we would encounter. But it was the first one since 2009 of the Canadian guidelines to specifically address anomalous veins. In the past, guidelines would just say, well, treat it the same as an ASD because the physiology is the same. So what does it say? So basically it says surgical repairs recommended for patients with partial anomalous veins uh, with functional capacity, when functional capacity is impaired, RV enlargement is present from the volume, and there's a net left to right shunt sufficiently large to cause uh, physiological sequelae, i.e. a QPQS ratio more than 1.5 to 1, ensuring that the PA systolic pressure is less than 50%, so that there's no pulmonary hypertension, so no Eisenmenger physiology. Or if you're going in for repair of a sinus venosus ASD, which will also it's an ASD, the physiology and the criteria is the same, um, is more than 1.5 to 1 low, low PA pressures. So 1.5 to 1 is the number to remember. So Zlatko calls me and he asks me what I should do. And I say, well, you got to do a shunt ratio intraoperatively. And Zlatko is like, okay, how do I do that? So um, for the surgeons in the case, how would you run, how would you do the QPQS ratio? Where would you take your samples in this case? This is for case number one the left upper anomalous pulmonary vein draining into the nominal vein. 
SVC and right atrium? SVC and right atrium. Uh, other or sorry, right right internal jugular and right atrium is what I meant. So so right internal jugular, okay. Any other takers for where else you should take samples? I, I can't Google fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> so if, as a reminder for the surgeons, the I know the interventions know the QPQS ratio is your aortic sat on your mixed venous sat uh, over your LA sat uh, minus your PA sat. So uh, with that in mind, uh, so where would you take your samples now? Zlatko, any ideas? Yeah, uh, sorry, I just got to think this through myself here, to be honest. Give us a hint. Uh, I gave you the hint. I gave you the formula. Uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so you need an aortic set. So luckily you've got yeah, an yeah. line. So your arc line, you, you don't have to go poke the, arc, the, the aorta. You've got an arc line. That gives you, and as long as it's a, if it's 100, it's easy. That's the same as your LA. Your MPA set, just do a little purse string on the MPA, stick a needle in there, get a sample. But now here's the trick. You should not be doing the, a right atrial sample because the RA, the SVC, the innominate and the vertical vein all have oxygenated blood. So it is contaminated and will give you a false low QPQS ratio. And most of our patients have a right IJ. And if the tip is anywhere in this junction, you will, you will contaminate with oxygenated blood from that innominate vein. So where you need to take it is down here at the IVC. So put a little purse string like you would for bicable cannulation. Use that as your, um, uh, your mixed venous. It's not the, the true mixed venous, but it is a good enough surrogate to tell you the degree of the step up in your uh, QPS ratio. So um, you do, do that and you get a ratio of uh, 1.2 to one. And uh, I tell Zlatko, just finish your cabbage, leave the anomalous vein and don't use the central line post-op for mixed venous sats because it's gonna be false high. Um, so, uh, but if it's more than 1.5 to one, then we'll have another conversation. I'll show you how to repair that in a second. So for case two, so now this patient, she was 38 years old with a right upper anomalous pulmonary vein. And so um, she gets diagnosed with hypertension at 48. She gets put on an ACE inhibitor. Then she gains weight at 58. She starts getting short of breath. Stress test, uh, she does about eight meds. Non-diagnostic ST depression that recovers within a minute. Um, echo shows still some uh, atrial and ventricular enlargement. Um, normal RVLV function, RVSP is only 28, still basically normal. And it goes a, uh, a cath and shows normal coverings. Um, they do a QPQS ratio um, and they get 1.2 to 1. I remember the previous MRI said 1.35 to 1. The RA sat and the PA sat is there is 83 and 85. So this is now for the cath guys on the call. Um, can you believe these numbers? And what would you do with the patient now? Any of your cath guys on? Yeah, it's Colin Barry. It seems, you know, the SATs are pretty high for RAPA and it's, so I, you know, I'd be suspicious on that. So yeah, I, I agree. Do, do a full study for sure. And then do, normally when I do right heart cath, I'll do PA, uh, RA, and aorta. And that's generally my kind of standard approach, unless mm -hmm. it's someone we suspect is a, is a congenital disease or shunt, and then we'll kind of do, based on what the history is, kind of to, and then do a kind of more of a full study, IVC, RV, RA, PA, both sides, SVC. Okay. Yeah, and in, and in this case, obviously sample before you think it's mixed, so. Yeah, yeah and that's the big thing yeah. here. So if you take the RA, there's already mixing. And so if you, if you actually go and you go into the nominate vein, go higher up, uh, so this was a right upper into the SBC. So it would go above that level. You actually get an anomalous sat of 72 and your QPQS ratio is 1.85 to one. And so that's a common thing that, that I see clinically that we get cast and they could discuss the patients and then where did you take the sample? And then the patients have to go back for a second gap. Um, so knowing the anatomy before and just adjusting to that. So, and then you can just do your FLAM uh, formula for anomalous and IVC to get your um, uh, mixed venous. Number. So David... As a practice, wouldn't it be sort of appropriate then to always, when you insert, for example, if you go IJ or femoral, not just do the peripheral from the poke at that time, I guess, at that site as a yeah, way, so as, as your routine, as part of everything? 
Um, so, so, you know, I think your catheter guys will agree here. If you take a look from your femoral vein right where you are, you yeah. have, then the abdominal organs haven't extracted your their oxygen. So, so it, won't be help, it won't be helpful. Yeah. yeah, it won't be as accurate. Yeah, okay. so you need to be a little higher. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you can, so like if I have an inferior, um, uh, uh, inferior sinus venosis ASD like Mr. Um, uh, RC that we share, you know, so if you if you're too close to the RA in the IVC, you can still get contamination there. So you got to be a little lower because mm -hmm. even if there's an eustachian valve in the IVC, it's not it's not always fully competent. Yes. So it's important to know the anatomy and be a little bit away to get your true numbers. Yeah. Um, and if you're not sure, then get an MRI. Uh, then just do flows, um, is the, what we usually end up doing. And um, in terms of the ac accuracy with MRI, they then be better, obviously. Yeah, the accuracy will be better because they measure flow at the PA and the aorta. So um, it depends okay. on the on on how good your MRI you know acquisition is and how comfortable your team is with getting those numbers. But the technology today is pretty good. Uh, it's not like an RV where there's a lot of trabeculations and there's a lot of uh, interpersonal variation on your analysis there. So, any other questions on on the on the diagnostics? Nope. All right. So uh, PAPVD. So there's four main types. Um, and interestingly enough, the different types um, uh, correlate with where they come from. Um, and the reason for that is just embryologically, uh, there's a principle in, in vascular formation that no artery, no two arteries will cross each other, one running over the other. They will actually fuse and have a, be branches of each other. And the same is, is true for veins. Um, it's only the systemic and pulmonary veins that will cross over each other um, in and around the heart. But when there's an anomaly with the pulmonary veins connecting to the pulmonary bud from the left atrium, that's when the, the, the pulmonary vein says, okay, what's the closest thing I can get to to drain? So then it makes sense that for your right upper lobe, you get uh, drainage to the right uh, atrium or right SVC. Your right middle and lower lobe uh, will go to the IVC. So that's your scimitar syndrome. Uh, type C here, the, le the left upper and sometimes uh, middle, middle segments will then go to the vertical vein, innominate vein, because the left SVC or the superior cardinal vein is the closest uh, uh, structure. And um, your left lower vein will just go straight to the carny sinus. Um, so those are the four different, different partial anomalous veins. And so partial anomalous veins, furthermore, can, it's important to realize if you have one, you might have two, because the, the definition of partial anomalous veins is, is less than less than four veins drain to the LA. So one to three veins that drain anomalously. Um, but most commonly, there's just one at a time. Um, obviously, the most common association that you want to know about is an ASD. But as, you, I, as I presented to you, case two, is an anomalous right upper pulmonary vein without a sinus venosis ASD. Uh, but you can see on the sketch here, like the scimitar, and I did one of these a few months ago, uh, doesn't have an ASD, that you actually have to create an ASD in your baffling. Um, and the left anomaly can have a small ASD um, or a PFO. And then the carny sinus one, there's usually an ASD as well. Um, so you got to go look and, and know what the anatomy is, uh, is intraoperative, uh, sorry, intracardiac as well. So repairing the case one, if you did have to repair it, is actually pre pretty simple. Um, you just have to ligate that uh, vertical vein and then use the left atrial appendage and flip it backwards and put that on the vertical vein and just do a side to side or you, you can have a filleted into side anastomosis. Um, the, the pitfalls here is that the uh, left phrenic vein, because this is like a left SVC and what is lateral to the right SVC is a phrenic, phrenic nerve. So the phrenic nerve can get injured in your dissection and freeing this up. Uh, so be, be aware of that. And uh, because it's venous structures, they're, they're low pressures. So look, two low pressure systems on each other, they can very easily kink. They don't have pressure to force them open to keep the lumen open. So you are bringing the vertical vein from a vertical position down to a horizontal position. So it's important not to rotate the vein and cause twisting and kinking um, in the process. But otherwise it's just a simple straightforward uh, anastomosis um, that any cardiac surgeon can do in my opinion. For case two, so this is the inside of the right atrium. So for the non-surgeons here, this is a surgical view. So on the, on the left of the picture, it would be the head. On the right would be the, the feet. So this would be the SVC coming in here. And there's the lumen of the SVC. These are the anomalous pulmonary veins dra draining close to the sinus venosus ASD. Here's your oval fossa in the right atrium, your drainage of your carny sinus. 
into Cox Triangle, and this is your IVC uh, opening on the right. So uh, this repair is pretty easy. Um, it's just uh, take a autologous pericardial patch, they close together and just sew, sew the patch, nice bulky patch over all, all the holes. Uh, what happens in the process is uh, basically at the bottom here, you can see the anomalous veins just drain into underneath that patch and then into the LA, and then the SVC blood drains over. Um, so, but with any of these repairs, there's three things that can go wrong. So number one, you can see that the atriotomy is quite high. So the SA nodes at risk, uh, depending on the anatomy, and I'll show you some other anatomy variations now, you can narrow the SVC or the systemic venous return, but you can also, if these veins are further apart, which I'll show you, you can narrow the pulmonary venous return. So if, the, if, the, if you have veins that, that join right at the RASVC junction, that's the easiest one to repair with a single patch. So those are the three complications we want to avoid. So the, the, the sinus node uh, anatomy, I, I think it's consistent uh, by textbooks. Uh, I think I can always see it. It's the, yellow it's the fatty tissue at the base of the SVC RA junction, right on the top of the sulcus terminalis. There's always fat there, so just avoid it at all costs. Um, but the problem is where is the vasculature going to that SA node? And um, uh, sometimes we're injured when we do transeptal approaches to the left atrium. But here you can see the variations. Either it comes through the aorta and the SVC or around the SVC or a double, double supply, which is great. Then you can cut one and still have supply to the other side. So it's not just direct injury to the SA node, but also the vasculature um, to the SA node that can get injured. But interestingly enough, the vasculature, if the vasculature is in, injured, the SA node will probably still start working in the future. So if you have uh, SA dysfunction from vascular reasons, just wait and you might not need a pacemaker. Uh, but it's important in the next repairs that we that, we, that I look at that we're going to show you. So you see up in the block here, that was the easy repair. The veins are close together. But now in the bigger picture, you can see that the two circles are apart. They're not, you can't overlap them. So to just sew a patch to try and get these veins, the pulmonary anomalous veins through the SVC to this ASD. And it's even more difficult if you don't have a sinus venosis and you have to get to the oval fossa. It's a very long baffle that you have to reconstruct within the SVC. And now you're at risk of really obstructing the systemic and the pulmonary venous return. So the repair for that is actually incising the right atriotomy up the lateral side of the SVC. And it actually, there's actually a vestibule because of the extra blood from the anomalous, anomalous veins. But there's a vestibule that you can incise in, but you got to stay behind the, the sulcus terminalis. So between Sondergaard's groove and the sulcus terminalis is where this incision is. So you can avoid the SA node sitting on top of the sulcus terminalis. And then it's a much longer patch that needs to get sewed to cause to make this baffle into the left atrium. And if you would just primarily then close the right atrium uh, over, it, over them, uh, then you will get systemic vein uh, obstruction. So you need to have another patch to close that defect as well. So that's called the two patch repair technique uh, when the veins are still pretty, pretty close. And the rule of thumb that I use is that if it's more, if you look at the pulmonary artery, artery that you're imaging, if it's uh, uh, more than the, the superior half of the pulmonary artery up away from the atrium, this repair will actually not help you. Um, so it has to be pulmonary artery and less. So the first repair is right at the junction, pulmonary artery and less, you could still get away with this. Um, but even, but higher than that, then you're gonna start risking, uh, you know, all three of those complications. Other thing to remember as well is to, know where the azygous vein is because if you include the azygous vein in this closure because they usually the three of them sit very close together in this picture it's it's quite likely that this up this upper vein might be the actual azygous um, so it's important to actually look on the other side of the pleura to make sure you have red blood in that vessel um, that you don't uh, cause a right to left shunt and have desaturation so what's the warden procedure the warden procedure it avoids all those complications. So it's a translocation of the SVC to the right atrium. Um, and then the distal SVC stump becomes your baffle um, for the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. I'll show you what that looks like. So firstly, it's a very high uh, bicable cannulation. I actually cannulate in the innominate vein and I, I use a plastic curved cannula and I use an I-40 and I'll make a hole at the back so it drains both sides better. Sorry. And um, then you have to, you try and transect above the pulmonary veins, making sure that the um, azygous is ligated because you want mobility on this section to move to the right atrium. 
you can see a patch being sewed in over this dome. And you can see now the pulmonary vein is going to go from here into the SVC and will end on the inside, going to channel this SVC to the left atrium. So you can see the dome is, is now covered. The right atrial appendage is then opened up and pecnid muscles are transected because it actually then allows the, the, the right atrial appendage to stretch to try and get uh, to that SVC. So here you can see the, so the, from the ASD that was behind this patch, it's just closed right to the SVC. So the SVC opening now becomes your channel that you're, that you're baffling. And with this, the, the risk of uh, pulmonary venous obstruction is, is just about zero. Um, the only risk here is that these upper sutures here on the left are right underneath the SA node and needs a lot of thin, uh, long bites to not injure the SA node from within. And then here you can see the reanastomosis of the SVC to the right atrial appendage. The only pitfall there is the rotation of the appendage that you can actually cause torsion and cause, cause narrowing, uh, but it's an easy fix. Just don't close the whole thing and put a big patch uh, anteriorly. Um, then you don't have to be as precise in the procedure. Uh, so this is what it looks like intraoperatively, just from a thin, so picture A. Um, so there's the SVC uh, opening there. That's, that's why there's a little bit of blood in, here, in there. This ASD had to be enlarged. That's why you see the sutures on the rims. The bovine pericardial patch is now sewed into to that area. And this is the area where the SA node will be. And then from the outside, so C is, in a, is, is, is usually in children that we can easily mobilize. Uh, enough um, uh, to get a direct anastomosis. And to, in order to do that, I also ligate and divide the right internal mammary vein um, and then free up the whole innominate, both innominate veins to get things to, to pull down. Um, and this one was done without an anterior patch. But in adults, usually you need a bit of an interposition graft if you can't make it work um, to get them together. And so that's the warden. So this way you have no obstruction in the back baffle and no obstruction in your systemic baffle. And if you did your, your patch nice and shallow here, you'll have no SA node injury. Um, and uh, if need be, if you did have an injury with the warden, you could still do a transvenous pacemaker. But if you have a narrowing or a borderline systemic venous baffle with your one or two patch technique, then adding um, a, a endovascular um, a pacing lead, then you're going to narrow your systemic baffle even more and you're going to go back with issues. So then you need to use an epicardial uh, pacing system. So what I look for after the repair is that the SVC has a, a mean gradient less than two uh, and clinically post-op follow that there's no SVC syndrome uh, features um, and that there on x-ray there's no regional low bar congestion. I leave them on aspirin for at least uh, six months, uh, for just while the, um, the, nom the sorry, the autologous patch gets endothelialized, and then do a CT or MRI one to two years uh, post-op to look at both baffles. And usually, if that's fine, if, if it's good by at that stage for adults, you don't need to check anything again. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's the warden gets you out of jail. I'll take any questions. Perfect, David. All right, if you can stop sharing your screen there. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that uh, I've I've certainly um, called you on a few occasions regarding congenital problem. Uh, so this is a good opportunity for all the cardiologists who are on the call here. Uh, there's certainly some guys from Moncton that I've spoken to in the last few months that you that we referred back to you here in Halifax for adult congenital issues. Uh, they do come up and they do. Yeah. Um, you know, of of the most common adult congenital, not just the regarding anomalous palmy vein. What is the the sort of more common things that you think you, you would like to see uh, that you may not see or that, you know, sometimes uh, get delayed for some reason? What are yeah. the... So, so the most common lesions, number one is bicuspid. So we all deal with bicuspid aortic valves. Um, and so coarctations in, in today's day and age get dealt in, in the early uh, infancy because of, uh, especially in Canada, being first world and good follow-up. So um, if those patients come back, they usually, if they have re uh, the, the treatment for that is still balloon dilation or with a stent, a covered stent if need be. And that can be treated locally, like when you do any of your aortic stuff. So Zlatka can deal with that. Um, the next most common uh, congenital anomaly is VSDs for us. And so they also get presented in, in childhood. Um, so the, really the most common thing for us is now that we're about 30, 40 years out from tetralogy, tetralogy repairs, is pulmonary valve replacements in patients with free PR, because um, they can go anywhere from the second to fourth, fifth decade before needing a pulmonary valve replacement. 
so that, that is the, the, the most common con uh, adult congenital surgery. Uh, but the weird and wonderful would be the next common would be these an anomalous single, single anomalous veins, but they're actually behind anomalous um, right subclavian artery. Okay. Very interesting. It's interesting. We had a couple of quotations. Uh, that's the, the very common finding, which is usually benign, uh, but periodically they can actually be a, a problem and cause compression. And usually what we'll see is when you do a TEE intra up um, is that you lose your right art line. Um, again, there's nothing to do if there's no, no dysphagia um, or if you have the other problem with them is if you have a trach patients getting tracheo uh, uh, aortic fistulas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's the one you don't want to see. Yeah, it's interesting. We had a few TAVIs in the past week with coarctation at the same time. So, I mean, the quarks weren't that bad, but these were sort of a bit unusual and we had to sort of ne negotiate a few issues. So they, they, they do occur. Yes. yes. Um, so with this, we're going to close for today. Um, thank you very much again, David, for taking your time to present to us and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, and this uh, session has been recorded for those of and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. Anyways, David, you have a good day. Good day, Thanks, everybody. Good day. Thank you. you. Thanks, David. Well done.